March 20th. We are on the fourth floor of Barge Hall, room 407. And the interview today is of our wonderful old wrestling coach, Eric Beardsley. And uh, this is, of course, an ongoing part of the Living History Project preserving some of these memoirs of outstanding people on our campus through the years. Good morning, Eric. Good morning, Milo. Uh, Ham Howard is running the camera. I am Milo Smith, a former custodian of Barge Hall. All right, Eric, what did you do when you first came to Central? And when was that? When I first came as a teacher? As a teacher. Well, I was hired as, the, uh, as a physical education teacher and a coach. And the coaching uh, assignment was in track, track and field. And then uh, uh, the next year, Leon Nicholson was able to come up with $900 and we started uh, the wrestling program, the first wrestling program in the history of the school. Good. What year was that? That was in 1959 that I, that I arrived, and in 1960 was the first year for wrestling. And you were actively on the university faculty until what year? Uh, I uh, retired in... Uh, 1986. Okay. 27 years. Good. On the faculty. Good. What rank did you hold when you first started? Uh, assistant professor. What rank did you hold at the retirement? Uh, associate professor. Good. Uh, now, you were also a student here at Central, right? Uh, yes, I was. What were the years that you were enrolled as a student? I was here uh, in 1950, or excuse me, 1947, 48, and 49. Did you graduate from here? Yes, I did. Got your I, bachelor's. I had gone to uh, Yakima Valley Community College for two years prior to coming to Central. What was your major? Uh, it was uh, physical education and an art minor. Now, I understand from friends of yours who knew you in those years that you played a little football at Central. Yes, I did. And uh, whether you would admit it or not, I understand that you were quite a fine football player. Do you have memories of being successful carrying the ball? Uh, yes, I do. I, I've had, uh, I had uh, some great years in football. And Seems they always remember uh, the the, uh, the things that you don't want them to remember. <laughs> like uh, the year we were playing P PLU uh, on the old rodeo grounds, and I got the ball at the on the uh, kickoff on the two yard line, and a big hole opened up, and I I ran through the hole, and I was uh, anyway within. 15 yards of a touchdown, and I looked around uh, over my shoulder to see if anybody was behind me, and nobody was within 10 yards of me, and I stepped in a, uh, some kind of a hole, and I started falling, and I fell on the 10-yard line, oh. and we did, not, uh, we did not score a touchdown, oh. and uh, the PLU beat us uh, six to nothing. Oh, Jesus. So the, and, but everybody remembers that story that was here at that time. Well, now, if you'd have been in the stands, you would have been <laughs> <laughs> bugging me about that for years, I know. But I Playing, did do some uh, things that were a little more positive, too. I came here in 56, and I, the first football I saw played by Central was on the rodeo grounds. Mm -hmm before they discovered it, that soil is full of vermin and that uh, scratches and cuts weren't healing properly. <laughs> and then they 
examined the soil and found out that it was poisonous. That, that I'm sure that, that was true. But what I remember most is that we played oftentimes in the rain, and five plays into the game, you couldn't read numbers on the players' uniforms for mud. <laughs> I'm sure that's you true. You must have fond memories oh, of the yeah. mud of the also rodeo Also the ground. snow. We played, uh, they didn't have very good uh, equipment for clearing the field yeah. as far as snow in those days. Uh -huh. So we played uh, with two or three uh, inches of snow all over the field. Wow. And that was not a pretty sight. Now, did you go to school any place after having graduated from Central Eric? Uh, yes, I did, Milo. I went to uh, uh, Springfield College in Springfield, Massachusetts. Originally, it was the International YMCA College. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason I went there was when I was growing up in Yakima, I had a real uh, wonderful mentor called Gus Shin, who was the physical education director of the YMCA in Yakima. And he always talked about Springfield College. Mm. And so that was always in the back of my mind. I did like YMCA work. And uh, I, uh, because of him, I, I ended up going to Springfield College and received a, a Master of Science. Oh, good. And good. Uh, it was a great, great school. Good. Did you have any trouble adjusting to going to school in the East? That's right. That was in Massachusetts, so mm -hmm. it was definitely in the East. Well, my wife was with me at oh. that time, and I think she had a harder time than I did because she'd never been away from her mother uh, oh. mm -hmm. that, uh, that far <laughs> anyway. And we, she did communicate by phone, but uh, we were gone for a little over a year, so... Oh. It was a long time probably for her, but we both had adjusted and had Good. some great times back there. Good. We didn't want to stay there. <laughs> now, did you teach in any departments on campus other than in physical education? Uh, no, I didn't, Milo. And what kinds of classes did you teach? Well, I, I taught a lot of activity classes, and then I did teach uh, uh, one uh, class that I taught all the time I was uh, here at the college was a theory class in uh, elementary school physical education for elementary school teachers. And I taught that almost every quarter. And I even taught that uh, years after I retired through the extended program on the other side of the mountains. So I did teach an awful lot of uh, elementary school teachers about uh, physical education at the elementary level. And that was one of my favorite courses. Did you teach wrestling? Uh, yes, I did. I had an activity class in wrestling, and it, uh, I taught uh, many different people what I knew about wrestling anyway. Now, I had a... I had an advisee many, many, many years ago who took a class in wrestling without my knowing it. I had not okayed it. I found out later he was in a wrestling class and I called him in and I said, why are you taking wrestling? He said, well, I want to take a class in wrestling and one in football and one in basketball because he said, my ambition is to be a sports announcer. And that made very good sense. I said, well, why were you sneaking around me? He said, I didn't think you'd okay it, so I just didn't say anything about it. No, I said, I thought that that was a very good decision. I think we need more sports announcers who have some grounding and fundamentals of the sports they're announcing. That was Pete Cunningham. You might not remember Pete, his dad had worked for the Daily Record down here for years before, and he was almost a four, straight four-point student all the way through school. Phenomenal young man. Now, Eric, 
that we've come to that marvelous question that I'm sure that you can uh, respond to. What humorous events do you recall in or out of your uh, activity area or in or out of your uh, teaching area? Humorous events. Well, of course, I've had a lot of uh, humorous events as far as my coaching experience mainly. Uh, for example, uh, I was uh, a real stickler on when we went on trips that when we when we uh, since we were on school money, we never uh, used school money for uh, any kind of pastry or uh, uh, as far as our diets. And of course, I used to have to every time I'd see a, one of my wrestlers uh, eating a donut or. A, some kind of pastry, I'd blow my stack. And of course, they they kind of teased me a little bit on this at times. But anyway, this one time down in Portland, I uh, I had a group of kids that really liked to get on me about that. And uh, I had gone out that night uh, and uh, came back fairly late. Uh, and when I got in, crawled in bed, I felt something in there that was uh, rather uncomfortable and <laughs> I kind of uh, didn't know what to think that I, I really got out of bed in a hurry because uh, I didn't know exactly what it was but anyway turned on the light and uh, what I found in there was a huge butter horn <laughs> about the so size of a you know one of those uh, cow pies and uh, here they they had got in in my room somehow, and uh, they were trying to make a point, I guess. Uh, uh -huh. That uh, I was a little bit too much of a stickler on pastry and so on. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that was one one story, and we we did have lots of them. There was another story that uh, was also in Portland where we took uh, one of the uh, student trainers with us. He'd never been on a trip with any athletes before and he was kind of a shy little guy but he was really excited about going he wore horn rim glasses uh, but anyway uh, when we got to the uh, hotel where we, we were staying uh, he ended up we had to bring up because of uh, having an uneven number we had to put three kids in one room and uh, he ended up with uh, two of our real, real cut-ups on our wrestling team, and in that room, of course, they each had a bed, and then he got the roll away. And of course, they got up to the room before he did, and when he got up there, they, they were there and they attacked him, and uh, took all of his clothes off down to, to his shorts, and put him in this roll away, with his feet sticking out one side and his head sticking out the other folded it up, took it out, this is on the seventh floor, <laughs> rolled it out into the hall, put him in the elevator, and set him, <laughs> set him down. And, and of course, down at the bottom floor, uh, he, the door opens, and here's a bunch of people standing there, oh, and he says, God. he says, help. <laughs> oh. Anyway, that was uh, kind of, oh. and of course, you had to have a sense of humor with those kids. But that, that was another story that I'll hmm. always remember. <laughs> I'm glad that you remembered some humorous things that happened while you were coaching. Now, because I'm going to ask you to look at the other side for a minute. Other than the shortage of money, can you remember any particular events or situations that you considered problems at that particular time? Problems for you as a coach? Well... There was one disappointing moment during our, probably uh, during the time where we had probably a couple of the greatest wrestlers that ever went through the program here. And that was the year we, we competed. It was the third year we competed in the Nationals. And it was at, uh, in uh, Lock Haven, Pennsylvania. And we were at that tournament, and then a week later, uh, 
the NCAA Division I tournament was being held in uh, Kent State. And, but anyway, we ended up third in the, uh, the Lock Haven, the NAIA National Tournament that year, and we had two national champions. And then we, every wrestler, we took six wrestlers and all six of them placed. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, I took four of those six from uh, Lock Haven to Akron, Ohio to compete in the NCAA Division One. That's the big, the, you know, that's the, sure. the, the biggest tournament in the whole United States. And anyway, and I had two, like they say, I had two wrestlers there that I thought could have gone all the way. And a lot of other coaches did too. But anyway, when we arrived in, in Akron, uh, Ohio, we, uh, which is right close to Kent, we stayed in the YMCA there and we were working out and we were really excited about the tournament. And then the next day when we had to go for weigh-ins and everything, we found out that they, they weren't going to allow us to compete because the paperwork had not been done uh, and somebody did not, I don't know who it was, whether it was at the top level or at a lower level, somebody did not get the paperwork sent in. So the NCAA would not allow us to compete and they would not take, uh, you know, a, a verbal commitment from over the phone. Hmm. So here we were sitting there with these four kids who, and uh, I could say two of them, I think, could have gone all the way. Now and I know the coach from Portland State, his team ended up second in that, in that tournament that year. And he said, if we'd have been there, we would have taken points away from this, mm -hmm. the other teams that would have uh, made it possible for them to end up winning the whole thing. And hmm. he felt that the two kids we had were, were better than the two national champions at, at their weights. Hmm. So that was, you know, really a big disappointment. Oh, was that slip up on the paperwork on this campus? Yes, it was. Ah. I had assumed. Were you able to trace three, it down I when you got back? Our, I think so, but I don't think it's something that. No, that's that, true. Know, we want. That's true. I mean, that's it was a big disappointment for mainly for the for the wrestlers. No, but we were we were doing a great job at that time. At, you know, wrestling on a real high level. Mm-hmm. You bet. In fact, we beat Oregon State that year, home and home, in a dual meet. And that, in those days, they just didn't. Nobody did that hardly. So it, we had quite a, quite a bunch of wrestlers. You had a young black wrestler, Eric, that was a personal friend of mine and still is. Um, he had a little bit of trouble on campus trying to be accepted by his fellow black students because they said that he had sold out to Whitey by the fact that he was participating on your wrestling squad. I don't know if you knew that, but he came in to see me one day with tears rolling down his cheek and I said, how can I help you? And he said, I just went to the black student's uh, room over in the union building and they kicked me out and said, you're not welcome here because you sold out to Whitey. And hey, I said, you have, what, aren't they, aren't they proud of you? You have made a considerable name for yourself nationally and you came back to this campus bringing great honor to the campus and I think you also brought great honor back to the black students of Central. Uh, were they not proud of that? And they said, well, some of them may have been, but the most vocal ones felt that I had sold out. Did you have any race problems because of your mixed uh, squad? No, the, the story you're telling me, is I, it's the first time I've heard that. Is it really? Yes. I don't think we ever had you any You know problem. who I'm talking about. Oh, yes. His he was, name he was a, not he was, a, he was a national champion, yes. too. Yes. Did not, and he and I had a great relationship. In fact, uh, a lot of people thought that he shouldn't have even gone to the nationals that year because he had a he had a four and nine record, hmm. dual meet record, and uh, but I knew that he had 
been wrestling some of the toughest against, you know, like Oregon, mm -hmm. Oregon sure. State. And he lost a lot of matches real close. And then when the uh, conference came along, he, he just ran away with it. And, uh, and then he goes back there and he really caught fire back there. And uh, in his the second round match, he ended up against, the, it was in uh, uh, Lake Superior, Wisconsin is where the, where the, uh, the, the uh, tournament was being held. And in the second round, he, he met the hometown boy who had been runner-up the year before. And of course, it was the only chance they had of a national champion. And they were all expecting that. And uh, this uh, wrestler of ours uh, just tore him apart. Hmm. Just unbelievable, he, what a showing he put on. And he went on and he won the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And it was a, what a great success story that was. Oh, we were very proud of him on campus. I wish that his, uh, his fellows in the Black Student well, Union that's, that's were also. That's hard to understand also. because we had a, also had a little Japanese fellow on that same team. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. they... Uh, Kano. Yeah. He's no longer, he died a couple of years did. ago oh. of uh, diabetes. And oh boy. He was uh, 43 years old, pretty young to die. But the uh, thing about those two guys that I appreciated was that some of the wrestlers that year were a little disappointed in me because of one wrestler who, who was kind of, they thought he was going to be a leader for them. And they realized that later on that he really wasn't. And he kind of got them into uh, they didn't like the way I was coaching. Uh, we, they thought I was spending too much time on technique. And of course, this guy that was the kind of the instigator uh, uh, thought that uh, we should be wrestling more. And he needed he needed more uh, technique work than anybody on the team. Uh, but anyway, uh, they they were going to hang me in effigy, and they had part of uh, the. The, the team uh, uh, had, uh, they were, uh, let's see, the part of the team uh, was for me and part of them were against me and they had a meeting and they wanted me to come into the meeting and uh, I came into the meeting and uh, it was really interesting because all the minority kids I had on my team were were backing me 100% and it was, uh, I was having problems with the uh, the Caucasian kids rather than the minorities. So I, I always felt I had a good relationship with, with minorities. Yes. Now, Eric, as you think back, what administrators on campus were especially helpful in the execution of your program? Well, I really have to give Adrian Beamer, who was our athletic director at that time, a lot of credit because he uh, he was he was not uh, easy to get money from, but he was always very supportive of wrestling. And uh, I, uh, uh, other than, than than Adrian, of course, the athletic director is the one is the key person, sure. you know, as far as your athletic program, and if he's really supportive of you, then I think that's, uh, you've got, uh, uh, you're fortunate there, and, and okay, he now, was. Thinking clear across campus, not only in relationship to athletics, but in relationship to teaching, to the day-to-day -day execution of the institution, who are the administrators that stand out in your memory as having been most significant in your judgment in the operation of the university? Well, I came when McConnell was still president here when I arrived, and then he left shortly after that, I think. I think it's because you came that yeah, he left. That could have been a part of it. But uh, I always thought, felt Jim Brooks was, uh, was very supportive, and did a fine job, and, and, uh, and uh, Perry Mitchell was, uh, of course he was in the registrar at that time, but uh, I think he, uh, he was a good 
person as far as athletics are concerned. Mm -hmm. Very supportive. And uh, and then of course Milo Smith was one of my great. Well, you supporters. know, you did something that uh, you're the only coach that I know of that ever did this. I can remember in several situations where there were young men who were considering the possibility of coming to Central and possibly wrestling. And you'd either call me up or you'd bring the student down to see me and give me a chance to talk to the student. Uh, this is what we are, this is what we can do for you. And it was almost a case of you don't have to believe Coach Beardsley, he's willing to let you go out and talk to other profs all over campus. And uh, I appreciated the fact that you trusted a lot of us talking to your incoming uh, athletes. And uh, I was so pleased then, of course, as the season went on, mm -hmm. to see these young fellows functioning on the team uh, for, uh, to the benefit of the squad, and then thought, well, maybe something I said might have helped that young man make his decision to come to Central. I'm sure it did, and that's why otherwise I probably wouldn't have taken advantage of you. I knew you <laughs> had to, what you had to say it was very convincing, and also you were a great support, a supporter of our program. Oh, I thought it was you wonderful. Seemed to, you seemed to be there at most of our matches, and, and you bet. we did appreciate that. Well, I, most of us who followed wrestling uh, appreciated the fact that it was an individual sport, and conditioning was of the ultimate importance. You bet. And, uh, I don't think you found the drinker carouser a functioning on a wrestling squad ever. They took care of themselves. That's true. Uh, now, do you recall any particular problems that existed between, let's say, your athletes and the faculty that sometimes you had to go to bat for them? Well, I. Yes, I always, of course, any time you, you know, you recruit a young man, uh, you feel a strong responsibility for him. And, and of course, there were a few uh, individuals that I recruited that uh, really had some problems with the grades. And, of course, I always felt that if there was a chance of saving uh, an individual, then I would go to bat for him. And, and in many cases, I did. Uh, maybe get a grade changed. And I think, uh, though, looking back, most of those professors that, that made that uh, change uh, never regretted it because mm. in many cases those, uh, those students went on and finished school and, and uh, many of them are doing really well now. Mm -hmm. And they may not have. Mm -hmm. So... Now, from your viewpoint, Eric, do you recall any significant problems that existed between students and administration here on campus? No, I really don't, Milo. I don't really feel that there was, was any uh, conflict there. Did any of your students get involved in any of those Vietnam War period, campus marches, and the students marched downtown and raised heck all over campus because they were so unhappy about the Vietnam War. Did many of your athletes participate in that kind of uh, campus activity? Not that I'm aware of. They may have, but I was never aware of it. But they didn't, you know, Usually, I didn't know about a lot of things. In other words, I uh, I used to get lots of calls if they were in uh, grade problems or if they were having uh, uh, financial problems. Or uh, very seldom would they tell me if they were having, you know, girlfriend problems or some of those other type of problems. So they could have been involved, but I probably would have known about it too because we were. A small, a small enough campus in those days that we it didn't take long for the sure. word to get around if somebody was 
being a little different. Was there any time left in the young man's day or night that he could work part-time while going to school? Uh, I think so. I think a number of our students did that. We were not what you'd call a high-pressure program. In other words, we were, none of our kids were on scholarship. And uh, we weren't, we had usually one workout a day. And, and uh, some colleges nowadays, it's three workouts a day. Wow. Of course, you're talking about these high pressure programs. Mm -hmm. And these kids are all being, uh, their, their education is being taken care of. Mm -hmm. They're being financed, in other words. Sure. But none of our kids were ever financed. And that's why I feel so good about what Sure. What happened in those years. Now, can you give us, for the record, right off the top of your head, some information relative to how many national championships did you have? Uh, the gym used to have a number of banners up there for the wrestling program. I'm disturbed that they have suddenly disappeared. I am too. I'm hoping we can get them back up. I, well, I'm maybe doing we can. some complaining. I hope so. Good. But uh, do you have any particular list that you could give us of the numbers of outstanding athletes that were in your program through the years? Now, I know that you have been admitted to the Hall of Fame up here at the education, or at the uh, athletics department. Mm -hmm. How many of your wrestlers have been accepted into the Hall of Fame, for example? Do you know? Well, I think we've got, uh, let's see, we've got at least five or six that are in, in that Hall of Fame. We have, uh, we have two that are in the uh, National Hall of Fame. And of course, I'm in the NAIA National yes. Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, we won two individual national championships during my mm -hmm. years of coaching. We were uh, runner up one year, and I think we were uh, third two years, mm -hmm. fourth two years. But we had some great years in the, the late 60s, and the, all the, the 70s were. Uh, were great years for us. Eric, do you know if many or even any of your wrestlers went on to coach wrestling? Well, that's the thing that I'm really proud of is the fact that uh, this year, uh, actually it's been going on for a number of years now, they have the state championships, uh, high school championships held in uh, the Tacoma Dome. And it's like a big reunion for me every year. I'm so lucky. I go over there to the tournament there, and uh, and it, uh, I can't go. To, I'm a member of the high school wrestling hall of fame, also, and uh, so they allow us to go anywhere we want in that building. So I'm right down there on the floor with all the coaches and and everybody else, all the other hall of famers, and I can't go ten feet without running into one of my ex ex-wrestlers who was Good. coaching or somebody I've coached against or uh, or somebody that's coached to you know coached against me and it's so it's a wonderful uh, moment every year for me to go over there Good. and that's I'm so proud of the fact that so many of my kids finished and went on and got into some kind of a career and so many of them I'd say oh it must be 70% of them uh, went into the teaching and coaching, uh -huh. and they're doing so well. Hmm. That's good. So I feel that that's one of my, uh, should be one of my really important legacies when I'm uh, at the end of my time. Okay, Eric, now we come to a list of very short subjects that I'd like to ask you to comment on if something comes to you. If it doesn't, okay. we'll move on. 
uh, concerning your period at Central. Any comments concerning the salary schedule? Well, I always had a kind of a, a uh, argument with that because I always felt that uh, the people who really needed uh, to have their salaries increased were those people that were just starting out and had large families. And uh, in many cases, uh, it was always, uh, when you got a salary increase, it was always on a percentage basis. And I always kind of felt that it should have been uh, across the board raise because mm -hmm. it, at the top they're all getting fur further and further away mm -hmm. than uh, those at the bottom and, and at the top they don't really need it as much. And uh, that, that was my, so I, I kind of had a gripe over that. And then people were held back, I think, because uh, they didn't have the doctorate. Yes. And I was always kind of disappointed in that because Years later, I found out that uh, in the code, it states that uh, if you are recognized by your peers as nationally, uh, you know, uh, outstanding, sure. then uh, you can be raised to any level that you they want to raise you to. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that. Uh, there are people held back because of that. And then the administrators, a lot of times, they pretend that they don't know about that that particular part of the code. Mm -hmm. and, uh, okay, yeah. while we're there, how about commenting on the faculty code? Did you feel that it was significant in your career? Well, I think it uh, certainly had its place, and that I think there are, uh, that uh, I think that, that sometimes the administrators people who are responsible for the people under them don't really uh, know the code or they uh, they pretend that they don't know the code and mm -hmm. I that that is kind of disappointing that they uh, hear all around you people are being promoted for uh, because they may not have the doctorate but they have well, they're known nationally and recognized uh, nationally and yet they're uh, some of them are getting uh, advanced and are promoted and others are not it is. Okay, well. in other words it, I think in some ways uh, there's some fairness that should be taken into consideration mm -hmm. there okay would you make any comment concerning academic freedom at Central well I've always felt that was important and I think that I don't recall any any situations in my years where where uh, it was not uh, really uh, uh, real effective and that it was not being considered okay. how about the faculty Senate well I know that they always in, in the years that I was here anyway that they were always very highly respected and the people mm -hmm. the people involved in that part of the program were uh, uh, really doing an important job and a good job any reaction to town and gown relationships not not really and I always felt there was a really good good relationship there. Yeah, I've recently become so surprised that I read in the paper that President Nelson is very interested in trying to improve the relationship between the town and the university. And uh, if something has happened to the relationship, it's had to have to, it has had to happen within the last five years because up until I left in 91 I thought that we had been on a gradual improvement program for the previous 25 years and that we had a good support from downtown and the support was mutual. I was rather surprised to read that in the paper. How about long-range planning on campus? 
Well, I'm sure it's been pretty good. The only thing is that uh, all of a sudden something comes up that I, uh, I don't know how it ever got through, but this nuclear uh, energy uh, power that is going right through camp oh. campus with these huge poles and these big wires. The wires haven't been put up yet, but that is going to just, you talk about the view of the beautiful valley and the, and the fact that uh, it's, uh, it's really going is is to be a sour note, I think. And, and you as the years go along, it's going to get even worse. If you it, believe the local editor, oh, publisher, I agree, I agree with him ugly, 100. ugly, ugly. It's, uh, well, he should have put a couple more uglies in there, I think. <laughs> well, I personally believe that it will still be possible to see the view without even noticing those poles after, after the first couple of years. We won't even see them. Uh, it's possible. I suppose it's a problem of timing. Well, I, it could have been done another way. We'd had to spend more money, I guess. Yep. But, but you know, that's, that interests me, though, that uh, we are accused as a university, oftentimes, by non-university people, of spending money carelessly, and yet Many of those are the same people now who say that the university should have found the five million dollars to bury those wires. Uh, I need a little more consistency and attitude about mm -hmm. the state spending of money on this institution. I wish we'd have had a little bit more information on it though at the time. Yeah. Uh, it seemed like the, the thing that was being argued was the parking, the loss of parking, mm -hmm. more than it was the fact that they were going to have to uh, not unbury the wires and, and put the huge nuclear-like uh, wiring up. Sure. Do you have any feeling about the building naming policies on this campus? Not really. No, I think they're fine. Uh, there, there are two basic attitudes. We have always had a very human attitude about naming. We have felt that it was perfectly all right to name buildings for living people so that they and their loved ones can really learn to appreciate the honor that has been given. And now I understand that there are any number of new people who have come on campus who have come with the other attitude from other places that no building should ever be named for a living human being, only after they are deceased, when they can no longer enjoy and appreciate. <laughs> well, I don't, uh, I don't know. I, I, the policy that has been in place is always been fine with me as far as I'm concerned. Me too. I, I enjoyed the fact that Raino Randall and Sarah Spurgeon and any number of people were able to appreciate the naming of a building while they were still living. You bet. I know Victor Bullion when the, the old library building was named after him. Uh, that was one of the happiest days in his life and he said so. Oh, bet. And I was so disappointed, really, when the library had to be moved out of that building because mm -hmm. he had served so well on this campus for so many years, and he felt that it was a greater honor to have a library named for you than any other kind of building because he considered that the central focus to the campus. Well, that makes sense. Okay, how about academic organization, Eric? Uh, you were here as I was when we went from departments to divisions to schools, and every few years we changed academic organization. Uh, do you have any comment relative to that? Now that uh, PE, for example, is in the school, of professional studies. Right. Well, it's kind of confusing, or it, it was, it seems to me. It just, it, it, I think if there's a real good purpose for, for change, then I think that's, that's wise. But uh, 
it just uh, change to be changing things for no really good reason. I I don't know, but it's hard for you know people to that uh, as you get older, it's even harder for for you to accept change. So I uh, I know that uh, I. Uh, as far as change, it's harder for me at this time in my life to, to accept it. Sure. I like things to go right along the way they they uh, they have for years. Any comment concerning the hiring policies and practices at Central during all the years you were here? No, I really don't have any uh, uh, qualms with the, what has taken place there. How about the pre-college preparation and quality of students who enter Central? Well, I think that's I think that's important because uh, I think the quality of the student is reflects on the on the college, and uh, I think that they they have to come up to certain standards that would. Uh, now, qualify, qualify them for a university. Now, having come on campus in 59, you were here when there was too much talk about the fact that Central had become the place where you go to school if you flunk out of the U or you flunk out of Washington State. And for a few years, that probably was true. I knew any number of students who were here because they did not keep their grades up on the other campuses, and many of us faculty members were very embarrassed that that was true. And little by little, we were able to turn it around, and uh, we no longer were embarrassed because we weren't taking the flunk outs. Uh, do you recall? having worked with a lower quality student? Well, not really, because I know that uh, there's always been a, uh, there's been criticism over the fact that athletes sometimes get uh, get breaks. And uh, I know that uh, in those uh, early years, especially, I had, we did, uh, we did some research on uh, on uh, the quality of our students, and it's just amazing how many of our wrestlers were, were uh, uh, well above a three point. And uh, most of most of our students graduated and uh, went on and became uh, uh, got into good jobs. Now, Eric, were you the recipient of any awards or honors? I know about. We know and have on tape now that you were elevated to the NAIA Hall of Fame and the local Hall of Fame. How about any other awards or honors that you, that you have been uh, awarded? Well, I'm a member of the High School Wrestling Coaches Hall of Fame, and then I'm also a member of uh, Yakima Valley Community College's uh, Athletic Hall of Fame. Uh -huh. And then also I'm a member of the uh, Northwest Community College uh, Association Hall of Fame. So actually, I'm on. Uh, I'm in five Hall of Fames, mm -hmm. which are uh, I feel real good about. Now, this next question hardly pertains to you, but I'm going to ask it. What specific contributions? Contributions. Do you feel that you made to the progress of your department or school? Well, now I'll speak partly for you in that, had it not been for Eric Beardsley, we probably would never have had, at least not nearly so soon, an outstanding wrestling program. Certainly you brought that to this campus. What other contributions do you feel you made up there? Well, uh, Milo, I really feel that uh, the uh, the thing that I feel most proud about is the fact that I, I really trained a huge number of wrestling coaches for the state. And of course, high school wrestling and junior high school wrestling is really big. 
and that uh, I think is is awfully important. And uh, I feel that uh, I used to, for years, I ran a camp called uh, Tall Timber Wrestling Camp, mm -hmm. and uh, every year we'd we'd have uh, students up there, and they were getting college credit for for being there. It was a nonprofit. Uh, corporation as far as the camp and uh, a lot of those students and then we'd also invite uh, coaches high school coaches with their wrestlers to come and and be counselors there and and then I would I would go out and bring in the the best coach I could get in the country and every year we'd have a different really outstanding coach and I think that probably that camp which uh, I was the uh, the camp uh, director, and uh, that camp ran for 16 years, and probably did more uh, to develop wrestling coaches in the state of Washington than, than uh, any other camp that I could think of. Sure. It was one of the few that was uh, being run at that time. So I think, uh, you know, as a coach, my contribution is that I I really did train a lot of outstanding coaches, mm -hmm. and uh, and hopefully I think I did train a lot of uh, good elementary school teachers in terms of uh, their knowledge of of physical education at the elementary level. Now, Eric, did you have enough time in your life outside of teaching and coaching and recruiting? to serve on any major committees while you were on the campus? Faculty uh, committees? Well, the only major committee was, uh, was uh, the uh, committee for uh, uh, promotion, mm. advancement and promotion. And that was, uh, I had served on that for about the first five or six years that I was on campus here. Did you ever serve on a building committee? No, but I felt that that was probably one of the most important committees. You Did you ever on. serve as a part-time administrator up in your area at all? Uh, no, I didn't. Okay. Are there programs or activities on the campus that you feel are not justified on a university campus? I really don't. Uh, feel I, I have any qualms about any of the other programs. Good. Now, you were married when you came to Central. Uh, yes, I was. In fact, I met my wife here. We were here as students. Both she of got us. her education yes, here also. Yes, she did, right. Good for her. Yeah. Uh, yes, you were a student here, and you did get a degree here. Yes, I did. And what year was that degree? 1950. 50. Uh, have, do you have any relatives other than your wife who have attended Central? No. Okay. Did you at any time serve in the military? Uh, yes, I did. Which branch? Uh, the United States Coast Guard. What rank did you hold? Uh, seaman first class. What was your work? Oh, I was, uh, it uh, was uh, a lot of guard duty. I was on a uh, Coast Guard cutter for a while. I ran a shore boat for a while and uh, that type of thing. Did you ever have a chance to use any of the GI Bill when you came back to college? Yes, I did, fortunately. Good. Now, is there any area that we have not touched on that you'd like to make comment for posterity? This is going to go yeah. in the state archives, and 25 years from, from now, somebody's apt to sit and listen to what Eric Beardsley thought back in 1996. Shoot. Well, there's one thing I should have mentioned when you asked about relatives. My daughter did go to school here, and Good. she graduated from Central. And this last summer, she uh, received her master's degree. 
oh, and she good. teaches uh, at Arondo, a small uh, school uh, about uh, 10 miles north of uh, Wenatchee on the Columbia River. And she just loves it, and of course she's uh, she uh, is a third grade teacher, and, and uh, anyway she she's doing well, and and uh, we're really proud of the fact that she, after getting married and having a child, came back and uh, finished her college at Central. You had a son that was a fine athlete. What's he doing now? Well, he's uh, in business up in Bellingham, and he's uh, he's in the yard maintenance and landscaping business mm -hmm. and doing really well. Any other comments you'd like to make for history? Well, I just uh, have to say that I'm proud of the fact that I've had the opportunity to be at Central and, and meet people like uh, uh, Ham Howard and uh, Milo, Milo Smith and uh, Bob Jones. Well, it was our pleasure, and I Eric. hope that uh, <laughs> I'll be seeing a lot of them down the road. You betcha. Uh, I'm so pleased that you were in the Coast Guard because I, uh, you're one of the few Coast Guardsmen I ever personally have known. And I wonder what kind of a man would get in an outfit that would wear a little sailor suit like <laughs> I had when I was in the first grade. Uh -oh. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Well, I had two older brothers that were in the Coast Guard, and that had uh, kind of influenced me. Where were you born and raised? In Yakima, Washington. You couldn't have hardly been influenced to join the Coast Guard from having been raised near the water then, could you? No, it didn't have anything to do with it. I do understand that, that, uh, that the figures from World War II, for example, gave indication that the young men who were raised in the coastal communities and were raised in, in boats were more apt to go into the Coast Guard and Navy, mm -hmm. while could understand uh, that. The fellows who were raised inland were more apt to go into the Marine Corps and into the Army. And uh, if there's nothing else, Ham, let's cut the tape.